Warning, this podcast may contain content and language that is not suitable for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you listeners for tuning in to the Weekly Double Down, a daily Double Down Network podcast. I am your host Cody and today I will be counting down my top 10 non-franchise horror films with a very, very special guest. Paul from The Countdown has willingly jumped on with me, and I'm super excited to present our list to you guys. It's a real good time coming in store. But before we get into the main segment of the show, we're going to head over to the hot spot where we give you guys the latest news in movies. Welcome to the Hot Spot, the weekly segment where I bring you the latest movie news. Today and in this week's episode and segment, we're going to be talking a little bit about Marvel and a lot of bit about other films. You know, I focus mainly on Marvel and DC so far this show, but we're going to spice it up and give you guys some different news in there, all right? So, that being said, I'm going to start off with the Marvel stuff, get it right out of the way. There's a huge Kevin Feige uh, interview done with The Hollywood Reporter. If you guys are interested in uh, hearing all about that, I will have a special episode on the Patreon account for you guys to check that out and see everything that he covers in that. But he did confirm that we are getting an R rating for Deadpool 3. You know, we've heard it a few times. There was still a lot of speculation, especially with the change from Bob Chapek to back to Bob Iger over at Disney. Um, but yes, Kevin Feige confirmed we are getting a rated R Deadpool 3, but what kind of rated R? Are we going to get our typical Deadpool hard R rating, or is it going to be a soft R rating where they kind of shy away from what we know as Deadpool, uh, to make it a little bit more kid-friendly so adults are more enticed to bring their children to go see this film? Now on the uh, switch side, or flip side of that, we do have a new deal. Tom Holland has signed a six-movie deal to work as Spider-Man for both Sony and Marvel in the MCU. And a major, major leak has come out, something that I think you guys might be interested in. It is being reported that Spider-Man is the likely person, along with Shang-Chi, to lead the next Avengers team in the King Dynasty. Um, We know Spider-Man is going to be a part of the King Dynasty in Secret Wars. Um, From what we know, they're going to try to follow and stay true to the comics of how Spider-Man gets his black suit, and we will be seeing that uh, black suit saga come out with this Tom Holland. So I'm really excited to see that. I'm really excited to see them stay true to the comics and allow him to be a leader. I think it could be a cool thing. Um, You know, typically Spider-Man's not a leader of the Avengers, but in this MCU, um, Spider-Man is the most familiar character that is actively being pursued. Um, You have like Doctor Strange and uh, Shang-Chi, She-Hulk, but those characters haven't been quite fleshed out besides maybe Doctor Strange. But moving on from the Marvel news and heading over to some Will Smith news. Um, A lot of people were very worried that all of Will Smith's upcoming projects were going to be canceled. And for a while, it seemed like it was going to after his incident at the Oscars in 2022. So, you know, we did get a confirmation. I Am Legend 2 is in production. So it will star Will Smith and Michael B. Jordan. They've already cast them. And it makes the alternate ending where uh, Will Smith's character survives and gets out. It makes that canon and it will go by that. Um, From most people's opinions, people would prefer the alternate ending. And if you have the option to watch the alternate ending, it's a lot better. Um, And personally, I think it's a, a great alternate ending. And I thought it was fantastic. A lot of people have mixed reviews on I Am Legend. Me personally, I love it. It was a great film. And I'm excited to see what's coming to the table. 
Hopefully we can see a second Michael B. Jordan directorial film. But while I Am Legend 2 has also been uh, confirmed, there's also the confirmation of Bad Boys 4. Now, my favorite Bad Boys film was Bad Boys 3. I did not grow up on the Bad Boys films. I didn't see them until much later, so they just don't hit as close to home. But I am very excited to see what they do with this franchise. And to be honest, I love the two. It's a perfect combination. And I would love to see them have just as many movies as the Fast and Furious saga. And that brings us to our last tidbit of news this week. And that is Terminator 7. Uh, from I believe it has finally wrapped up pr- uh filming and production and is in post-production and will be coming out either the end of this year or next year i'm not 100 percent certain but it does seem as if james cameron is trying to reboot this franchise with dark fate being the first terminator film in a new trilogy now i hated genesis dark fate was all right but i only truly like two of the terminator films the first two besides that You know, I think they could have a really good film here, and James Cameron seems to be pretty heavily involved in the project. While I'm not a huge fan of Jim Cameron, I have to say, his work with uh, Terminator, fantastic. Terminator 2, Judgment Day, one of the greatest films ever to be released. So, I'm really excited to see what they can give us, and... That brings us to the end of the hotspot. Let us know what your guys' thoughts and comments on the news topics that I brought up today in the comments. If you guys want to hear more uh, weekly news, you guys can sign up for our Patreon where we will be posting on every Friday. We will be posting a full news review on everything I find in the movie realm. So, if you guys aren't subscribed to our Patreon, go check it out. There's a few different tiers. And we are now getting into our main segment. Alrighty, so we're into our main segment, and I'm really excited for this guest. I have Paul on today from the Countdown Podcast. How are you doing today, Paul? I am great. Thanks so much for having me on, Cody. It's a pleasure to be here and you know, a new and expanding podcast and one that's finding its place in the world. It's, it's nice to be a part of it to give a little bit back to the podcasting community. So thanks for having me on. Of course, of course. You want uh, So Paul's from The Countdown. I just want to say I've been listening to the show for oh, years. Really? It's absolutely wonderful. It's the reason that I got into podcasting in the first well, place. Well, that's an honor. It's awesome. So, Thank you. So... Special place in my heart for this episode. <laughs> it's a really big one for me. Uh, I see. But we're going to be counting down our our non-franchise horror films today. And I'm going to give it off to Paul to give us his number 10. All right. This was not an easy list to make. I did a lot of agonizing. I have seven honorable mentions. So we'll skip straight past those and go straight to the number 10. Uh, one I've only seen once, but it made a huge impression. I just haven't got around to it again. It's really hard to find these days. At least in my part of the world, it might be different, say on Shutter or some of the other streaming services. I think that you have a bigger content with, but it's from 2006. It is a found footage mockumentary film called "Behind the Mask: The Rise of Leslie Vernon." Have you heard or seen of this one, Cody? I have never heard of this okay. film. All at right. All. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'll give you some viewing homework. At least one film from my list. There's a couple other obscure ones as well for yourself and your listeners who might want to chase them up this is basically set in a world where freddy and jason and michael and chucky all the slashes are real so they really existed and serial killers are have this whole fandom behind them and it follows this documentary crew who follow this guy leslie vernon who's going to be the next serial killer du jour so they are charting his rise and the problems he runs into and they, they follow him around murdering people. And as you can imagine, things don't go well for this whole crew of people eventually. And 
I could assume. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's really clever, and I'm genuinely shocked that 17 years later, we've never seen a sequel of, of any description to this film because it is, was so inventive and so different, and it really stands out. It's, it's quite comedic. It's not a straight, straight horror. Like it's, it's absolutely taken the piss out of the whole slasher genre and some of the conventions and the like. But at the same time, it's got some pretty gnarly kills. doesn't skimp on the gore. So it kind of ticks all the boxes for you if you're a horror fan, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I cannot believe I have never heard of this film. That's definitely something I want to check out. I'm a huge fan of slashers. Like, it, Scream and Halloween are staples nice. of my horror youth. So, uh, but... Funny enough, I have something that could be a horror movie, couldn't, you know, it kind of walks the line of that dark comedy, okay, yep. um, and it's a recent release, it's called The Menu. Oh, ah, okay, yep, yep, I can, yeah, I guess in my yeah. head, as a massive horror film fan, I don't tend to class that as a horror film, but my co-host on our show, Wayne, he's far less into horror, he hates it, so he absolutely thought it was a horror, so I reckon that qualifies, go ahead. So for me personally, I laughed at this movie more than anything. I thought it was more of a dark comedy. But there were a lot of thematic elements that reminded me a lot of Ari Aster's work. And we'll definitely reference him here in a little bit. We will. But, yeah. But uh, I really enjoyed Ralph Fiennes. Uh, He used to play Voldemort, but... This is a character where he portrays someone more sadistic even than one of the greatest supervillains portrayed on film ever. Um, And to do that is really hard. And what they ended up doing is just transitioning a lot of regular everyday like lives that are in the service industry into something that could be awful and terrifying. I don't want to spoil too much of it because it is a new release, but... I would definitely recommend anyone to watch this movie, especially especially if you work in the restaurant industry. Have you got that experience, Cody? Are you a, a hospitality survivor <laughs> or current? current yep. Yes. Fresh out of high school, I spent about three years in, uh, in the kitchen, so... Ooh. You know, I've seen the horrors in there, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got out. I got out. But uh, I guess that's going to send me over to your number nine. My number nine is probably the hardest core film on my list. It's a French film from 2008, directed by Pascal Logier. Uh, It's called Martyrs. Have you seen this one or heard of it? All right. No, I have not. So I'm going to be careful here because this is a film you need to know as little about as possible going in. It opens with a very quick scene of a young girl, 12, 13, 14, don't know, somewhere around that age range, running out of this kind of abandoned building, terrified and covered in blood. And then we go, we cut to sort of, it's not even clear how long later it is, but it is later in time, I'll just say that. And there's this seemingly normal French family going about their day, having breakfast, sitting down together, and these two women burst in with shotguns, or guns, I can't remember to be honest with it, shotguns or not and proceed to terrorize them and where the film goes from there and why they are doing the things that they are doing will completely blow your mind it's only 99 minutes this film and by the hour mark i don't know a single person who's watched this film who isn't squirming in revulsion is the wrong word in discomfort it really gets under your skin this film (laughs) And that is an absolute definite choice of words, I will say. You just have to kind of roll with this movie and see what it does to you. But if you're a horror film fan and you've never heard of they did a terrible American remake about four or five years ago. Ignore that shit. Just watch it. Put on the subtitles if you have to. If you have to watch an English dub, do that. But watch this original film. It is one of the most shockingly difficult and uncomfortable watches you'll ever get. And it will affect you, even if you're a hardcore horror fan. Well, that sounds right up my alley. I'm currently studying French. Might as well practice and watch something. So, yeah, that sounds interesting. Can I ask what the remake's name is? It's called Martyrs. So be careful. You want the 2008 (laughs) version. Nothing later than that. All right. Yeah, definitely be on the lookout. I... um, 
I have a history of not liking when they take a foreign film, especially in mm-hmm. horror, and Americanize it. So that's a that's a big problem with, with yeah uh, and then, me and, and the horror community. And they're about to do it again for a film that can't make this list because it did have a sequel and a prequel, Train to Busan. I imagine you've seen that one, Cody. Yes, I've yeah. seen Train to Busan. It's one of my favorite zombie uh, movies. Likewise, absolutely incredible. Sorry if you can hear that. For some reason, we have a helicopter, presumably a police helicopter, flying overhead. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> they are remaking it as Train to New York, and it's directed. Yeah, oh, it's directed no. by the guy who directed uh, The Night Comes for Us, which is a really gore-tastic action film that Netflix did a few years back. So, can't remember his last name. Tim. Oh, and he did a segment on VHS Two, the one that um, he co-wrote or co-did with uh, Gareth Evans from the Raid fame. So, yeah. Yeah, I have someone uh, who did some VHS stuff on here and. I'm I'm sure we'll talk about VHS a little bit, Um, but I'll definitely, I don't know if I'm definitely going to check out Train to New York. I think it might be one of the past movies. I'll look for the reviews first. Fair enough. About Train to Busan. We're not talking about that. We're talking about non-franchise horror films. So your turn, right? (laughs) Yes. And with that being said, I have an interesting one at number nine. It's a zombie film that kind of clashes action movie with horror and World War II. Oh. So, I don't know if you've seen this one. This one came out in 2018. Yeah. I'm referencing the J.J. Abrams produced Overlord. Yep. Good flick. Yeah, so Overlord was uh, interesting. It was one of the first films that I was... When I first started watching horror movies, Is one of the first ones that I like went and saw in the theaters. And, you know, I, I'm not a huge zombie fan. My favorite zombie movie is Shaun of the Dead. So going into Overlord, I was... I was clueless as to what I would see, and honestly, it kept me engaged. It was a genre blend that made me love Saving Private Ryan more. But uh, overall, I just thought it looked fantastic. Uh, The way that everything was presented, it was beautifully shot, and at the same time, the CGI that they did was perfect for such a low-budget film. Yeah, um, I bought this on 4K after watching it at the cinema, and I, it's one of the few 4Ks I haven't gotten around to watching yet. So you've just given me incentive to return to it. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's definitely a good pick. I think I watched this one with my dad, and uh, he even liked it. So <laughs> that's how I knew. I was like, yeah, this one's uh, Are you make implying it your dad and you don't see eye to eye on films very often? <clears throat> well... My dad is also a huge horror buff, so he loves horror nice. films, but his horror films and my horror films are very separate. I like more nuanced films. He likes in-your-face stuff. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Sounds like a top bloke. Oh, yes. He's had me watch some amazing but awful things over the <laughs> years. But I'm going to send it over to you for your number eight. Okay. You mentioned him a little while back. Ari Aster is, to my mind, the best new filmmaker who previously has worked in the horror genre. I don't think Bo is afraid, judging by the trailer, looks like a horror film, but looks very interesting nonetheless. But I'm going with, at number eight, his 2019 film, which was my favourite film of 2019. It's how high an esteem I hold. Mr. Astor, it's Midsommar. I'm assuming you've seen this one, Cody, because it's new and yeah, I'll. Yeah, I recently recorded an episode on this show. Uh, one of my guests wanted to talk about it, so we, we're, we'll be talking about it on an upcoming nice. episode. Uh, so you guys can hear my thoughts on it there. But yeah, this one didn't quite make the cut. It is on my honorable That's mentions. Cool. Um, I I had a problem watching it. Like I said, I'm not a huge fan of the gore, so right around that halfway mark, I was like, turn it off, and I resumed it the next day. But the ending of that film had me... That, that movie might have actually had me quivering a little bit because it seemed like the most realistic way that a horror movie could play out in real life. This you know? film is, to my mind, one of the greatest breakup films of all time. It is. It shows all the horror of a relationship which has run its course and 
is just going through the motions. And in real life, of course, people would eventually fade off and break up and, and move their different ways. In this film, because it's all set against this strangely trippy daylight sort of horror film, which nevertheless really unnerves you. And like you say, there's some graphic gore moments in the film. But I actually think what really does this does this film its real justice is the first 20 minutes are hugely impactful. And it was like a gut punch, the, the moment that sort of sets the rest of the film up for me. And I did not see it coming and I wasn't prepared. And I should have been after Ari Aster's pre, uh, previous film, which clearly we're going to talk about again. Uh, yeah, this one really impressively put together... It doesn't feel it's 150 minutes. I know people who absolutely hate it. I've got you know, fellow friend podcasters who will... we Not that we die on any hill about it, but we have very polar opposite opinions of it. And I can see why. It is one of those films which you could love, hate. There's probably not a lot of in the middle ground on this one. Yeah, there's, there isn't too much middle ground uh, for it. So I really love it. I just didn't want to overdo the Ari Aster on my list, you know? Uh, so I wanted a little bit more diversity, sure. but when it comes to it at the beginning of the film, I'm a huge fan of the, uh, the imagery that they use to set up the stages of mm-hmm. grief that they're going to take you through. And like you said, it's a great breakup film, but at the same time, it deals with the stages of grief in a really twisted manner. So I'm a huge fan of it. I love nice. that film. Well said. So I guess that brings it to my number eight. And this is one, I think he came out in about 2017. It was a little flick that not many people knew about. It is set in the uh, suburbs of Detroit before the eight mile line. And my eight is It Follows. Yeah. Have you seen this film? It's an honorable mention of mine. It was very close to making that nine, ten spot. So, and had I been, in fact, where exactly did I have it? Had it at 12. So there you go. Yeah, so It Follows is a very interesting uh, interesting film. I'm not sure if you could classify it as a succubus or incubus kind of thing, but you could uh, say that there's a sex demon involved, and it's very interesting about how they don't really deal with a whole lot of deaths throughout the film until the very end, and how the, it's more of a moral battle within and the horrors that come out of that so i really enjoyed the way that it was presented and honestly when we're talking about cinematography just the opening shot of a girl running in heels was i i was hooked from the first shot that's right she comes running out of the house runs down the street right yeah Yeah, it's a good film it's a very very interesting metaphor as well for you know, sexually transmitted disease and, and what that means. And if you haven't seen it, the concept is that if you sleep with the wrong person who has this curse upon them, this thing follows till it kills you and then it will go back for the person before. So the concept is you sleep with this, you get that person to sleep with as many people along the line and so on and so forth to get this thing as far away from you as possible because otherwise it will get you. It, I love some of the discussions around you know, what happens if you got on a plane and, and went to a different country or flew overseas? Well, it would just get in the water and walk across the bottom of the ocean and still come after you, but it would get to you eventually. So that, that in itself is kind of a creepy idea to me. Yeah, it really had me, it had me kind of creeped out. Like I said, I like the nuanced horror, uh, but it had me creeped out, especially like uh, right around the middle part when you would just randomly see this thing get closer and closer. But the movie did wasn't setting up for that. It had its jump scares where it wasn't setting up jump scares, and when it where it set up jump scares, it died off, which I thought was a very interesting way to go about the film. And a great soundtrack. Can't remember who it's by, but that sort of electronic score is pretty awesome too. So, yeah, I think my next pick will have a great soundtrack mm. too. But I want to hear what your number seven. All right, my number is. seven is from a man who, jeez, he's name these days in Hollywood doesn't mean the same thing but in the early 2000s Neil Marshall was the shit if I can put it that way and obviously his most famous film he can't do because they've had a sequel to it but his earlier film called Dog Soldiers from 2002 is basically a trapped in a area group of British soldiers who are on a training mission 
and they in the in the back of the Scottish wilderness, and they stumble across a werewolf, and this werewolf traps in this building, and it becomes dudes with guns fighting against werewolves, as it turns out to be. So, great fun. Have you ever seen it? I have not. I surprisingly, I've only seen two werewolf oh, movies. Oh, okay. So not your subgenre of choice. No, I've, I've never actually uh, delved into it, to be honest. Okay, well, I'd heartily recommend this one quite clearly. It's excellent fun. It's got you know all that sort of mateship and camaraderie of soldiers, and you come to like the, the ones, certainly the ones that live towards the back half of the film. And, yeah, I wouldn't say it's wholly unpredictable, but there are moments where people sort of die, in it, which is always a big thing for me. If I can't predict who's going next, and I'm wrong about that, then that film will go up in my estimation because when you've seen as many horror films as I have, you get pretty good at spotting who you think is going to go this, 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 all the rest of it. So, And just really well shot. It's a low-budget film, so don't go on expecting glossy and amazing, but uh, go on <coughs> expecting fun. Yeah, I, I love me some low-budget. Uh, honestly, one of my favorite, like, well, I've only seen two. So out of the two, my favorite was uh, Slice with Chance the Rapper. It was a... Uh, very low budget horror comedy. Yeah, I don't know but, if I've seen that uh, one. It, it, I think it's worth a look. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't think have? I have. Yeah. So it, um, the girl from um, the Joker. I can. I'm blanking on her name right now. Um, I think it's Zoe or uh, Zazie Zazie Beats. Beats. Yeah. She was also. Yeah, she plays the main character, and it is very well done. Okay. Oh, so I would definitely give it look a at look. that one. Yeah, thank you. Um, but as for my number seven, like I said, killer soundtrack. I have my, probably the most uh, stapled movie, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Oh yeah, never even crossed my mind. That's a uh, that's a good pull, a nice old one. Yeah, it was between this and Doctor Sleep because I controversially enjoy Dr. Sleep more so than The Shining. Yeah, um, I, I tend to agree with you. You can't... Uh, you can't beat Jack Nicholson in that movie. He was the whole thing. He encompassed the whole movie, and his acting carried it to an extent that it would not have been... like. I don't think anyone else could have played mm. that character, you know? Um, I think it's quite honestly almost a perfect horror film uh, i think the pacing could have been a little bit better but besides that for what they did i love it hands down one of my favorite films um if we were talking about 80s films it'd be a lot closer to the top of the list right okay so a huge fan yeah uh, my history this one's a bit a bit patchy when i first watched it i think i was too young and got bored like you're saying because it's it's also quite different to the book, which I really enjoyed the book when I read it before seeing this film. So to see the changes they made kind of confused me and I wasn't... Anyway, coming back to it, circling back just before Doctor Sleep came out, however many years ago that was, four years ago, I think, uh, I enjoyed it a lot more and appreciated a lot more of what, what Stanley Kubrick brought to the table. And as you say, Jack Nicholson is incredible in the film. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm going to send it over to you for your number six. Okay, six is another film which is kind of probably a little out of left field depending on how big a fan of this director that you are. It's one of his early films. In fact, it's the film that was made which he handled They off this basis they end up giving him The Lord of the Rings. It's called The Frighteners from 1996. It's a New Zealand okay. production. Have you seen this one? Uh, a long yeah, time okay. ago. But this yeah. one's... <sighs> I don't know, it obviously came along at the right time in my life. I was relatively young and just charmed the pants off me. It's a great, it's got some funny moments. It's got a great comedic turn from, why am I struggling to remember? Oh, Jeffrey Coombs of Reanimator fame and from Beyond fame as this asshole FBI agent. And the film follows Michael J. Fox. He's the main character and he's a medium who can actually see ghosts. He's got a posse of ghost mates, if you want to call it that, who do go into houses and, and you know scare the inhabitants hence the frighteners a little bit and then he comes in and exercises the ghosts and gets paid for it so he's basically a con artist and and then there's this 
death figure with this huge cowl and scythe running through and killing people and he becomes embroiled in trying to stop this thing and it goes it has a good twist in it that's all I'll say about that Michael J. Fox is Michael J. Fox he's brilliant as in his and everything and it's yeah it's not gory it's not, it's not really gory though, although there are moments in the film but it's uh, a lot of fun it's almost like a, this adventure and kind of goes in directions that at least I didn't expect so enjoy the shit out of that one yeah, I saw it when I was like 16 or 17. I don't remember the twist, so I'm going to have to give it a rewatch here shortly. I think I own this one on Blu-ray, nice. so it might have given me a given me another uh, movie to watch, awesome. man. Happy to do so. Uh, so uh, with my number six, I actually have my second film that came out in 2022. Um, and honestly, I went into this film knowing absolutely nothing about it uh a prequel was released in the same year not a huge fan of it even though most people highly regard that one higher but my number six is ty west's x does it become a franchise though if it's got a prequel <laughs> and a sequel coming okay <laughs> so Your show you so, can bend the rules however much you want yeah you can roast me you can you can put me on fire but um I'm, I, because it doesn't have that third movie out yet, I'm just putting it on here because of how much I loved this movie. You'll be able movie. to give me shit for one of mine too. It's okay. Uh, I'm sure. I'll probably... I don't know. I'm not winning. <laughs> no one is. Thank God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I, I do want to steal his laugh for a sound clip on this show. Just so <laughs> you know. So <laughs> But uh, X pretty much it's it reminded me a lot of Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof, which is a film that not many people have seen. Uh, it was part of that double feature, which included uh, Planet Terror. Planet Terror, yep. which to me that's an amazing horror Good movie. Fun. If you're if you think about it, yeah. Um, but Ty West made a start in the VHS series doing the uh, anthology. And I really just like how he translates that 70s grindhouse uh, cinematic feel and gives it a modern tale in which it's very easy to follow along. You're not very confused at all, even though it's dealing with something that's pretty weird and out there and they don't just flat out tell you. Yeah. Um, like, so again, interesting. it just came out. I'll give you that. What were your thoughts on this one? I was, I was a bit lukewarm about X, to be honest, because I often happens here in Australia is we get films a few weeks after they've premiered in the States or you know, normally in North America. So the, the internet was buzzing. People were raving about it. My history with Ty West is a bit lukewarm and he does have some films that I think predate VHS, including House of the Devil and The Sacrament. I really like The Sacrament. Wasn't a, as big a fan of the slow burn of House of the Devil. So... Yeah, and then the innkeepers as well, somewhere in that sort of timeline. So I came in sort of, okay, well, this, everyone's saying this is his best film, this is going to be amazing. And I'm like, yeah, it's good, but it's not like the second coming, the way people are talking about it. And I dislike Pearl flat out, just it's not for me. I know what he's doing, and I get what he's going for, but it just, just didn't work for me. So... Yeah, Pearl was the same thing for me. I flat out hated that movie. Oh, good. We were um, even from watching X it. and loving it. <laughs> yeah, from watching X and loving it to seeing Pearl, like uh, it was it was a major letdown. Um, I thought w I was signing up for a true slasher movie, and there were no true kills until the very end. And even then, it was subpar in my opinion compared um, to X for sure. Yes, comparative to X, definitely. Uh, the thing that I like about X the most is the gore, and that's surprising for me because I'm not a huge gore fan, um, but they did it perfectly, and they did it at the right times to really land the points of contention in the film. Fair enough. So I think that brings us to the top half of our Does. lists, and that gives you your number five. All right. You know, you've done the right thing. You've been a bit more varied and didn't want to have the same filmmaker on your list twice, whereas I just went, eh, can't leave this off. Hereditary, Ari Aster's first film is amazing. Flat out amazing. It's 
Got a everyone's really good at it, particularly Alex Wolf and Tony Collette, who was absolutely robbed not being nominated for an Academy Award just because she's in a horror film. And to think this is a dude's first film is absolutely incredible to me. And it just follows after Tony Collette's character's mum dies before the film starts. It just follows a family in their grief and slowly the evil that her mum's been involved with comes to the fore. And this is another film which has one or two really shocking twists that you will not see coming. So, and I, and I think it looks amazing too. It's just so the, the use of darkness and lighting in this film is, again, for a first time filmmaker, just blows my mind. Yeah, so I have this one a little bit Ooh. higher. Uh, I ha- hold this as very high regard in my personal opinion. It is one of the best horror films to have ever been released. Um, I think Ari Aster nice. has just a perfectly twisted mind for horror and doing it <laughs> in, like I said, a nuanced manner. Um he has a surprisingly large repertoire of short films that he's actually released before this. Okay. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the film Something About the Johnsons. No. Well, maybe. Maybe. There's something tingling in the back of my head, but I couldn't tell you what it is or what it's about. So Ari Aster's first film, you can find it on YouTube for free. Um, it's a 30-minute film about a black... Uh, suburban family in uh, America and um, that one is probably his most fucked up movie out of all of wow. them if you thought Hereditary and Midsommar had some messed up stuff in it it doesn't use any disturbing imagery but it is the worst film that he's made but also probably one of his better definitely not seen it definitely will check it out uh, you've, you've piqued my interest yeah like I said, it's free on YouTube. Nice. Okay. Do you want to say more about Hereditary now? I'll wait till it gets to you, your list, wherever it is. Um, no, I think I think you captured most of it. Uh, like I said, it is. I think it is top tier. It should be regarded as one of the best horror films and should be looked at as an example for people to build horror films on, especially moving into this newer age of horror. When I went and saw it, we saw it lucky enough to see the advanced screening here. And it was packed. It's not often you get an event screening, at least in our town, where it's every seat's taken. But we were literally in the front row, bottom left, because we just got there a bit late. And we sat next to some random dudes. And the very first scene of the film, when she's in unpacking boxes, turn the light off, and you can see, like, the silhouette of her mum just in the background there. This guy next to me, some random dude, is literally saying, Fuck this shit. Fuck this shit. Fuck this shit. <laughs> he was freaking out. <laughs> and that was his mantra through so many scenes of this film. And like, you think that would be annoying, but he was doing it at the right times, at least that I found it very amusing. So that's the effect that Hereditary can have on people who maybe aren't as well-versed in horror as, as some, other, some of the rest of us are. So in preparing for... Um in preparing for this, I kind of went back and listened to uh, the reviews you guys did on most of these movies. And the reason I watched Hereditary in the first place was because of something Wayne said on your guys' podcast. Um, it, it, something about him turning into a little bitch boy in it or something. I don't know. It's Wayne. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I watched it and I, 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 I looked for it in the corner and I didn't find it for like the first three times that I watched it. And then I turned the resolution up a little bit and brightened it up. I found something that in the opening scene, when they show you like the treehouse and everything, yep. you can actually see all of the people. If you turn the brightness up, all the naked people at the end of the film, you can see them standing around the house, staring at it at the beginning. Wow. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, like I said, nuanced horror. Absolutely. You know, this, this term of elevated horror, which, you know, gets banded around a little bit, but if there is an example of it, it probably is hereditary. Well, one of the most uh, used examples of elevated horror, I hate using that term yes. because I don't think it's suiting, 
But it's Jordan Peele's 2017 film, Get Out, and that's my number yeah, five. Yeah, it's on my honorable mentions as well, a little bit lower down. But please, tell us what you love so much about it. Oh, goodness. So, Get Out takes you on a journey, on a weekend journey with a couple that is going to visit her parents at their lake house for some sort of party slash reunion. And as the weekend progresses, you can see these people's nefarious ways start to come out and expose themselves more. Uh, if you haven't seen this film, skip forward a minute or two because I'm going to spoil it. You and six years. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. Yeah, exactly. So, the ending of this film put me personally into just a week of constant thought of how are we treating people in general just as a populace and are we treating people as equals just generally. And um, how it really begs the question of how do you view people that are not like you and Absolutely. in every single different yep. way. So I re I really enjoyed the fact that it hit on really good social commentary while proving to be one of the greatest horror films and starting off like we've talked about elevated horror. I think this really boosted that and got people interested in it a lot more. And of course, seeing Jordan Peele come from, you know, his Key and Peele comedic days and just write a masterful masterful movie. I think he won an Oscar for screenplay yeah, that year. Yeah, I think he did. And uh, I, I just really like it. What What do you like about this film? Yeah, apart from everything you said, which, you know, a, a horror film that makes you think and has social commentary, which is relevant, you know, some of the very best horror films over the years, you think of Night of the Living Dead and even Dawn of the Dead later on. It just It's another string to the bow for this particular film. But also what it does at the end is it doesn't it doesn't even go down the, the normal road of a horror film. Like, I would totally have expected ending A and we got ending B instead. And so you come out of there <coughs> in a different mindset than you probably would have otherwise. So I think that was a, a really great choice as well. Um, all the performances are really good in this film. I think Alison Williams is his girlfriend. She just She's really good in the movie too, as well as um, uh, Daniel Kaluuya. Uh, they're, they're all excellent. Everybody's great in this movie. So, uh, if, yeah, if you, as you say, if you haven't seen it, please do because it needs to be needs to be watched. It, it is definitely if you are a horror fan and you haven't seen it, shame on you. <laughs> well, <laughs> unlike though, my number four. If you haven't seen this one, I forgive you. And it is one of those films which I'm now going to say to you, Cody, if you haven't seen it, and anyone else out there who's listening to this who is a horror film fan, presumably you are, if you've gotten this far into the episode, this is a must-watch. It's directed by Bill Paxton, the late, great Bill Paxton. It stars him as well. I think it's his only feature film oh. he directed. And it stars, along with Bill Paxton, Matthew McConaughey, Powers Booth as well. And it's called Frailty. And Frailty is one of the cleverest scripts ever put together it is written by a guy named brent hanley who i'm going to look now because i don't recognize the name at all has he done anything else he's just done bugger all else and nothing since 2006 i just don't understand to be brutally honest so effectively this follows a two timelines in the past two kids two boys their dad played by Bill Paxton comes home and says I've had a vision from God it's our job to kill the demons masquerading as humans in this world and oh. therefore oh become goodness. a serial killer basically and one son is like okay dad I'm all in the other son is like you are crazy this is going to send you to the electric chair or the equivalent thereof and so it's the dad and the son trying to convince his other son. We fast forward to the future where the son who was saying this is crazy is now played by Matthew McConaughey. And he has this uh, FBI agent coming around to sort of ask about this, this history, which the guy's played by Powers Booth. And so he's relating this story to him. And the film goes from there. To say anything more would be to do a disservice, but it's one of the only horror films that has two twists both of them work. I say any film, actually. Forget horror. How often do you see a third, a film with a third act that has two twists and both of them 
will absolutely knock your socks off. So it's brilliant. Frailty is so underrated. On Letterboxd, only 45,000 people have logged it, which to me is just absolutely criminal. Check it out. So I have not seen it. And yes, I will definitely be watching that. I think that's going to be on my watch list for tonight since it's so high I'd love to hear list. what you think about it, whether I've talked it up too much, which is always a, a fear of these kinds of shows. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll let you know what I think Please. of it after I view it. But I am going to challenge you because my number four also has two Ooh, twists. Okay. Okay. So it is another recent film, and this film is last year's Barbarian. Have yeah, you seen yeah, of this? Of course film? I have. Of course. I'm just trying to think. Two, two twists. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. Um, I would say they're not as impactful as this. So there you go. By comparing the two, I would. There is one reason this film is high on my list, and that is because when it gives you the second twist of what's going on exactly, it presents, in my opinion, the greatest one shot in horror history. Ooh. And it does it in a 35 millimeter grain film, and they actually filmed it on an original cinematic camera. So when they did that, I lost my mind, you know. Um, <laughs> Towards the end, when they start developing and find the old man in yep, the yep. in the cave system, when that happens, at that point, I was sold. I thought Justin Long played his character great. Very much so. I thought Alexander Skarsgård was going to be the bad guy. And Bill, hang on, Bill, Bill Skarsgård. I'm not going to. Sp- Am I mixed? Was it Bill or Alexander? Alexander, the big hulking dude from the Northmen, and Bill's from it. Ah, uh, yeah. Yep. Yes, yes, Bill would be... Yeah, Sorry, Bill. not to correct. My apologies. So, just, hang on. Because you'll have people screaming at you down, no, it's down, fine. down the, the screen or their listening device. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'd get raped in the comments. That would be awful. <laughs> um, I, I honestly get them mixed up quite a bit. You know, I saw Tarzan and It in the same day. Fair so. enough. <laughs> But uh, I'm assuming you've seen this film. What were your thoughts yeah, on it? Yeah, I liked it. I liked it a lot. It was just outside my top 10 from last year. Again, maybe the victim of people talking up too much. So, you know, but I thought it was really well shot, very interestingly shot. That big, I don't even know if the right word's a twist, but the, the switch the film takes kind of really unsettles and throws you and almost to the point where you're like, hang on, has, have we slipped on another film? And it, and it kind of eventually it all sort of comes together. But yeah, you know, I really enjoyed it, and it's from another guy who has a comedy pedigree, right? Zach Zach um, Craigers, I, I think believe... is that his name, off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but I mean, comedy guys end up knowing their horror. Here, yeah, I'm looking it up right now. Zach Craiger is his name. I was right about that. I said Craig is close enough. Uh, he's one of the founding members of the New York-based comedy troupe, The Widest Kids You Know. So there you go. Yeah, definitely a comedy comedy guy for sure. But with that being said, I don't want to talk too much more about Barbarian. I feel like I've already spoiled it a little too much for my viewers. What is your number three, Paul? My number three is... Uh, this, well... All my films from here on out, no one's going to be too surprised by. Like I said, we can argue the merits of at least one of them when we get there. This is probably, along with Scream, the smartest deconstruction of the horror genre that's ever been put to film. And this is Drew Goddard's The Cabin in the Woods from technically 2011, but it didn't come out anywhere until 2012. Have you seen this one? Yes, it's on my list. Oh, okay. All right, so we can both talk about it. Um, I think this film's... I think, um, obviously, among horror film fans, it's not underrated, but this is so clever, this movie, and what it does and how it explains basically all horror films and explains the way the tropes of the horror films and then eventually itself becomes a proper full-on horror film with an ending that we just don't do these days in films. So I love everything about it. I think all the performances are spot on. We get to see an early Chris Hemsworth, um, Richard Jenkins, Bradley Whitford as the two dudes working at this company are just brilliant. Yeah! Wow, what a movie. So, 
this was again back in my senior year of high school. There was a big hurricane. Me and my dad were pretty much just together in a house for the entire month of October. And um, my dad, being a huge horror film, he made me watch this one. And let me say, it it took me by surprise from the cover and everything that I had heard from when I was younger. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to watch this movie. I'm just starting my horror path. I laughed so hard. I love this film. And, like, it, it shows it's really high on my list. And I'm really glad you have it on yours. <laughs> me too. Because nice to have some, uh, otherwise, I would consensus have crossover. Pretty. Uh, but I'm going to go right back to you because my number three is hereditary. Okay, here's where you hereditary. So we know one of your top two. Oof. If, I, yeah. if I've kept track correctly, my number two will not be on your list uh, because you've said repeatedly, Cody, you're not a gore guy. Well, strap yourself in because this might be the definitive gore <laughs> film, but it's played very, very tongue-in-cheek and deliberately very, very over the top. And it is my second Peter Jackson film. It is, it is his zombie opus. It's called Brain Dead here in Australia, but Dead Alive, I believe, in the North Americas. Uh, did your dad make you watch this one? Yeah, it's no, not a fair enough. <laughs> I totally get it. I have seen this film more times I can count. I saw it at the cinemas twice. It's one of the, We don't get a lot of this in my small town. I say small town. I live in a city of two point something million people, but... Certainly back 30 years ago, we didn't get many midnight screens of films, but this is one of the only ones I got along to, and it just blew my mind, and the whole crowd was into it, hollering and whooping, and again, that's the kind of thing that doesn't happen in Australian cinemas. I understand it's a bit more common in, depending where you are in the States. So, it got all the fun of that. It just, that final 40 minutes of this movie is some of the best gore ever put to film, with some of the funniest moments I've ever seen. When you've got the intestines and colon running around trying to strangle people because it's become reanimated just the organs themselves and at whatever moment just stops and lets off a fart that's my sense of humor to an absolute t so there's an indication for you if you want uh a guy with a (laughs) no i won't spoil that in case you decide you do want to see this film just old school practical effects to up the way the absolute nines brain dead is one of the best gore films and horror films and comedy films all put together ever made for me well i'll definitely check it out see if i can laugh even if it's disgusting that's fine but uh if it's just like the saw films those no, get under I mean, my the skin, saw films are played you know? very um straight very dark and edgy this is played for if you haven't seen it then from the sounds of cody this is played for for real laughs when you've got <laughs> we talk about this scene on our show a lot when you've got a bunch of people, you know, they're set in the 50s, I think, um, sitting around a dinner table, very posh, you know, all the all the hoity-toity of this small village, village, small town in, in um, Wellington or outside of Wellington in New Zealand from memory. And one guy's going on and on, banging on and on about his pudding. And one of the people at the table is slowly dying and turning into a zombie. And her son is trying to make everyone convinced that she's just normal and everything else. But a sore on her face bursts and pus drops into this guy's custard bloody pus and he starts eating it it's Ugh. just so disgusting and so awesome <laughs> <laughs> oh you, you you're making me uh now <laughs> that's what you that's what you're in for if you give it a shot you know i'll have to drink very heavily before <laughs> i watch that one um But we're going to go into our honorable mentions because, as I said, my number two is Cabin in the Woods. So go ahead and give me some of your honorable mentions before we reveal our number one. All right, we've already said It Follows and Get Out from your list. Then I've also got Event Horizon, the only good Paul W.S. Anderson film ever made. Uh, Night (laughs) of the Creeps from Fred Decker, the guy who would write Monster Squad and then unfortunately return to us with The Predator, is a great 80s, again, comedy horror. Splinter is a, not many people have seen it, creature feature, which is set in one place. Have you seen Splinter? Uh, no, I haven't. I've heard Check of it. Check it out. It's, uh, directed by, I think it's British director, Toby Wilkins. It's just set in one gas station. Two people hijack uh, a couple's car, two criminals, and they have to hole up at this gas station. And there's this, this thing which, if it gets a splinter in you, that part of your body starts, you know, takes on a life itself and starts trying to kill you 
basically. So mm. it's really different, really so cheap, really short. It's like 80 minutes. You're in, you're out. doesn't outstay its welcome. And how these four people sort of band together, try to survive is really cool. That is incredibly intriguing. I'll definitely have to check that one and out. And last two from me. Uh, two, as, sorry, Cody. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, last go two from it. me. Two French films, so you can keep practicing your French. One is called Inside from 2007. I'm not even going to try and say its French name. And it basically follows a pregnant woman who's tormented by uh, this other woman who's trying to get into a house and do something to her. Watch the film to find out what and how. And the last one is Horty, Horty Tension or High Tension is the English translation from 2003, directed by Alexander Aja. Um, people are divided on the ending of this film, I will tell you that in advance. Some people love it. Some people say it's just fucking stupid. Um, I fall on the side of, had we had a better ending, this would have been one of the greatest horror films of all time. So there you go. Ah, okay. I mean, if it's if it's that close to greatest horror films of all time for you, then, you know, might just have to check it out and practice my French. Looks like I got three films. I'm going to be sitting there pausing, trying to figure out what you're saying. <laughs> just put the subtitles on, help yourself out a little bit. <laughs> Uh, as for me, my honorable mentions, I have Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. Yep. Uh, I thought that was a great play. Uh, I had Cabin in the Woods on my list, and Tucker and the D- D- Tucker and Dale vs. Evil just doesn't no. stack up to it nearly as but much, so I didn't want to throw it on there. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this one. It's an Irish film. It's called The Hole in the Ground. I have. I have. I've seen it. Yeah, so I really like that one. It's a great film about a little boy. If you like, you know, kind of like demon possessions with kids, if you're a big fan of The Exorcist, check Mm -hmm. it out. It's pretty good. Um, I also have the likes of Happy Death Day, Last Night in Soho, the Edgar Wright film. Um, It wasn't as much of a horror film, so I couldn't throw it on there. It reminded me of Freaky, which I really enjoyed. That was good fun. That was a great movie with Vince Vaughn and Catherine That's Newton. It. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I also had Midsommar is also on my honorable mentions. And lastly, I have Zombieland. Yeah, good film. Good film. Um, Although that had a sequel. Film, that definitely film. had a sequel. That definitely is not a standalone horror film. <laughs> yeah. That is why I had uh, pushed, pushed it off, off of my enough. list. All right. Is this it? Is this the moment? Our number one? Yes, this is our number ones. Paul, go ahead and tell us what right, you got. Right, so I've been hinting all along that you might be able to take me to task for one of the films on my list as to whether or not it's a franchise film. It's not technically, but people consider it to be the first in a franchise of three films called the Cornetto Trilogy because they are all directed by oh. Edgar Wright and star Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. I'm talking about Shaun of the Dead. So there's never been a, an okay. official sequel to Shaun of the Dead. It, yes, it's a comedy horror, but... I talked a little bit before with Cabin in the Woods about being a, this great deconstruction or um, un, self-referential kind of horror film. This film, pound for pound, every single moment in this movie pays off. I don't think I've ever seen a script as well written and realised on the screen as this film. Every moment there, if you're a horror film fan, and particularly a zombie film fan, there are so many nods and acknowledgements and homages to all the other great films and Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg are absolutely massive George Romero fans and they wanted to make their homage and this film is it and somehow it surpasses the master's efforts as far as I'm concerned anyway it it's funny genuinely funny it's incredibly well made has some great gore moments in it because it doesn't skimp particularly in the last half of the film around the gore and it's also quite heartfelt there are genuine moments in this movie because Simon Pegg believe it or not is a bloody great actor and there are moments in this film where he really shines and really sells the angst that his character is going through. There you go. Probably talked enough about yeah. Shaun of the Dead. I hope it's okay to be on this list. Okay, so I'm not going to rag on you because <laughs> Edgar Wright is my favorite director. Yeah. Me too, pretty much. And you are right. Technically, it doesn't have a sequel. And most people don't even know about the Cornetto trilogy. So... Uh, I'm really glad you have it on there. I'm really glad you didn't have something from the Firefly trilogy on there because that could technically fit in or whatever. Okay, no, Rob Zombie's not my favorite filmmaker by comparison. (laughs) (laughs) But Edgar, I I absolutely love Edgar Wright. Uh, Shaun of the Dead, like I said earlier, is my favorite zombie movie. So 
absolute love for you awesome. and having it on Glad your list. <laughs> but, but sadly, it didn't even make my honorable mentions. I'm not sure why I didn't think of it. I think of this movie more as a comedy than anything, so I guess that's probably why I didn't Fair put enough. it on there. But really, really good Thank pick. You. Um, as for my number one, I've actually sat on this one for a couple years now, and... You know, a lot of people are going to be like, why Why would you even consider this? In my personal opinion, James Wan is the master of horror right now. He commands, mas- he commands the horror genre. He has his hands in the Insidious and Conjuring universes. Mm-hmm. He, ha- he created the Saw universe. Yeah. And what he does in his most recent film, Malignant... I absolutely wow. loved. Wow, you're going to piss off about 50% of people with that pick and 50% of people just fell in love with you. So that's a brave call. Yeah, so this is a heart pick, 100%. It is, I don't care what anyone else has to say. <laughs> I could not leave this off the list and I could not leave it out of my number one spot. I sat down, I've watched this film probably five or six times already. Um if I'm introducing people to new films, this is always one that I bring up if they're, you know, getting into watching horror movies. I'm like, have you seen Malignant? I'm not going to say much about this film other than it is a horror film on the premise of sleep paralysis. That's it. If, um, if that doesn't creep you out enough, just Google what uh, sleep paralysis is and then watch the film it'll it'll have you on the edge of your seat the entire time wow okay what do you think about this movie, i liked it Paul? i didn't love it the way clearly you do cody uh, and i certainly didn't hate it i thought it was a lot of fun in the direction that it ultimately went and has a couple of pretty incredible scenes i gotta say in that um, back end of the film uh, it's all, i won't say anything more because my criticism of the film would be too much spoilery so i'm just gonna leave it at that all right all right uh, but those are our lists. We'd love to hear what you guys have in the comments. Go ahead and leave us some of your interests. Paul, would you like to tell them where they can find sure. you? Sure. I think the easy way these days is to the countdownpodcast.com. Go there and you'll find all the links to all the stuff to do with the show, including how you can listen along and subscribe. And, and uh, yeah, basically, my co host and I just count down a, a list of some description every week. It was film and television, but after 400 episodes, we switched it up 11 episodes ago to be whatever the hell we want to count down. So it's, we've varied things up a little bit there, and we also 